I am working today with Aisha Lewis. She is a staff attorney at the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. And um, it has been an honor to work with Aisha these last couple of months. We uh, had the opportunity to collaborate on an 8.452 writ petition. For, so from um, a notice of intent that was filed from the termination of services. And it was really great to have another set of eyes, another set of resources, in an effort to assist uh, a parent who had disabilities. So Aisha, if you wanted to introduce yourself and say a little bit about DREDF. Uh, thanks, Louise. And I also wanna make sure to say that it's been an honor to work with Louise. Um, she's so experienced and learning more from her about family law um, has been a great experience. Um, so DREDF, um, uh, as Louise said, I'm a staff attorney at DREDF. And DREDF is a National Civil Rights Law and Policy Center based in Berkeley, California, and directed by individuals with disabilities and parents who have children with disabilities. Our mission is to advance the civil and human rights of people with disabilities through legal advocacy, training, education, public policy, and legislative development. Among other things, DREDF provides amicus support, co-counseling, and technical legal assistance for other attorneys. We're fortunate to be bringing on a Skadden Fellow this fall, whose work over the next two years will focus on supporting the representation of parents with disabilities in dependency cases. So we urge you to keep in touch with DREDF as we further expand our work in this area. Great. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, we'll go to the next one. So this is uh, the information about live ca captioning that's available during the presentation. So there are over 4 million parents with disabilities in the United States. Parents with disabilities are at a higher risk of being referred to child welfare services than parents without disabilities. Unfortunately, they face high removal rates, up to 70 to 80% for parents with psychiatric disabilities and 40 to 80% for parents with intellectual disabilities. Um, and you can read more statistics in Rocking the Cradle, which talks about this in depth. So disability is a broad category. The Americans with Disabilities Act, um, otherwise known as the ADA, defines disability as either having, having a record of or being regarded as having um, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, this definition is meant to be construed in favor of broad coverage to the maximum extent permitted by the terms of the statute. So um, California law also follows the ADA's definition of disability. Now, some examples of disabilities from the federal regulations are cancer, diabetes, post-traumatic stress disorder, and living with HIV. So as you can see from these um, examples, disability is incredibly broad and it might encompass um, conditions that people might not typically think of when they think disability. Okay, and so back in 1997, we had the Adoption and Save Families Act, which was passed. And, you know, at the time, it was meant to uh, be a good thing. And I'm sure there are ways it has been a good thing. It was to address the problem of children lingering in foster care. However, it created some of its own issues. Uh, it was so focused on providing permanency for the children that it created some, some barriers and, and hurdles for parents who are trying to reunif reunify. For example, a key provision of the ASFA is that 1522 rule, which requires that um, a petition for termination of parental rights has to be filed within this time period. And so many parents with disabilities find it difficult to comply within these strict timelines. And in addition, reasonable efforts are required, but the term has not been defined in federal regulations. And just last month and well, month-ish, uh, in January, there was a rally in Sacramento by different parents, parents, justice advocates, and lawmakers regarding the goal of pressuring state lawmakers to push back against this ASFA. Um, they feel that their focus was more on parents who've been incarcerated or parents who have substance abuse issues, but the same concerns apply to parents with disabilities. So that's something I think to, to watch for and that uh, the U.S. Representative Karen Bass out of L.A., she introduced a 21st Century Children and Families Act, which the idea to extend the timelines for 15 to 20, um, from 15 to 24 months, which could be helpful for a lot of the parents. 
Um, so disability discrimination is prohibited uh, under state and federal laws. Um, it's prohibited in government programs, services at, and activities, which includes child welfare agencies, service providers, um, and state courts. Um, in addition um, to not proactively discriminating, um, appropriate reasonable modifications for parents with disabilities is also required under um, anti-discrimination statutes. All right, um, what's going to follow next are some of the key provisions, which I'm not going to read, but just wanted to flag for you. These citations are also available in the supplemental materials. So here we have the ADA and the next, now this is section 504. And then we have the Cal government code. Um, and then the next section is the provision that refers back to the ADA. Okay. Um, it's also important to note that the ADA unfortunately cannot be used as a defense in California. California courts have held that the ADA doesn't directly apply independency proceedings and cannot be used as a defense in them. In Henry Anthony P, um, the court held that the ADA does not apply to termination of parental rights and proceedings because such proceedings are not services, programs, or activities within the meaning of Title II of the ADA and therefore aren't preempted by it. Um, so what that means is uh, parents might have a separate private federal cause of action under the ADA that they could institute in federal court based on the public entity's action or inaction, but violation of the ADA is not a basis to attack an order issued within dependency proceedings. However, you could um, still allow for indirect use of the ADA. The standards provided by the ADA and other disability non-discrimination laws can and should be considered when determining whether an agency has provided the reasonable reunification services required by the Welfare and Institutions Code. So some examples could be um, looking for a definition of disability um, to determine whether or not a, a, a client has a disability um, that would be legally protected. Also um, identifying reasonable accommodations that might be possible as well. Okay. So to introduce the topic of reasonable accommodations and tailored reunification services, we wanted to share this cartoon. In the cartoon, um, I hope you all can see it. Um, in this cartoon, a porcupine encounters a panda bear and another animal, maybe a weasel, um, who are wearing balloon hats. He asks to have a balloon hat too. But because the porcupine has quills, a balloon hat that's designed like the others uh, isn't going to work for him. It would pop as soon as it was placed on his head. But the other animal, um, and you can see the animals are confused by this. However, the other animal creates a custom balloon hat that the porcupine can successfully wear in the bottom panel. And what this cartoon so beautifully illustrates is that while at first it might seem impossible to provide appropriate services for parents with disabilities, but with a little creativity and a willingness to engage in the process, appropriate solutions can be found. And like the uh, helium balloon for the porcupine, these solutions might look a little bit different from what works for other people, but they can still be effective. Okay, so Jonathan Grossman already discussed a little bit about reasonable services in his presentation, um, but I just wanted to bring it up again uh, in the context, obviously, for parents with disabilities. So parents, all parents, are entitled to services um, that are tailored to their indi individual needs, including the special needs of parents who have a disability. So a standard package of parenting, anger management, and support network programs that's not necessarily gonna work. Like Aisha said with that last comic, we have to be creative. We have to think things through. We just can't apply the same, um, the same services to everyone. And these efforts have to be made in spite of the difficulties of doing so or the prospects of success. But, they, but again, and this is what the agency tends to use um, to get out of the reasonable services, it, that they don't have to be perfect. 
They just have to be reasonable under the circumstances. So what ends up being reasonable under the circumstances is different for uh, obviously parents with mental disabilities. And it's important to keep in mind the case plan provisions in uh, Welfare and Institutions Code section 16510.1. And there's three main goals. You have to identify the reasons for dependency, set forth specific goals and describe why the plan services are appropriate to meet those goals and to describe the services to be provided. And what we end up finding often with parents with mental disabilities is that, that that case plan does not specify what the problem is and what needs to be changed. So in this one, mental disability must be the starting point. And that's that Patricia W case that uh, is always gonna be kind of a starting point when it comes to bringing up reasonable services for a, a parent with a mental or any sort of a disability. And there's this In Ray Jamie M, which is also a great case that says harm to the child cannot be presumed from the mere fact that a parent has a mental disability. And that's why proper assessments are going to be crucial. Judge Edwards, again, um, he had set forth in an article which is attached in our supplemental materials that kind of talks about uh, best practices, right? What we would want to see from the juvenile courts. And it's a set of, like, I think there's seven, um, seven steps. And this is to make sure that reasonable efforts, to make sure that that mandate is meaningful in cases involving parents with mental disabilities. So the first thing that needs to happen is to determine whether the mental illness or disability has a negative impact on the care of the child. Oops, sorry, I went back. Um, such that, you know, state intervention is necessary. And here, determine the nature of the mental illness. Determine whether it is treatable. Determine how the agency's proposed case plan will address the parent's rehabilitation and whether the proposed services are specially designed to address the parent's disability. And all these things seem so basic, but you know, a lot of times they, they are not happening. What should the court expect from the agency in order to prevent removal or assist in rehabilitation of the parent? Can the parent be re rehabilitated in the foreseeable future? And it's important to know that rehabilitation does not mean that the disability has disappeared, right? That's not going to happen, but only that the behavior no longer creates harm to the child. And are there support persons who will enable, who will be able, sorry, uh, will enable the parent to safely care for their child? It's also important to remember that time is of the essence, um, particularly when representing parents have tight deadlines. Uh, specialized services may take longer to identify and secure. Uh, psychiatric disabilities particularly may require long periods of time for successful treatment, especially if this is a situation where the first time that psychiatric disability is manifesting for the parents, uh, they're starting their treatments from scratch. Um, and in addition, parents with disabilities can face further delays due to the need for medical or psychiatric treatment. So what we thought would be kind of interesting today, instead of just talking to you about the law, and we've provided that in our materials, but is to do a case study. And basically it's the case that Aisha and I worked on, um, and it was for an 8.452 rate. It was just a couple of months ago. So, uh, and we're going to go through what happened in this case, um, what services were provided, what the court's response was, and then also on appeal. Um, spoiler alert, we did not prevail on appeal, uh, but we did our best. So the important thing about this case, it came in specifically because of mother's mental health illness. So the petition that was filed uh, was mother is exhibiting symptoms of a mental health illness that hinders her ability to provide adequate care, supervision, and protection for her child. So it happened July, 2019, um, mom was placed on a, a 5150 hold due to apparently an attempt to suffocate her child and making statement of wanting to harm her child. So the child was removed. At the time that he was removed, there were 
quite a few theories on what mother's mental health disability was. Uh, the ambulance, the EMT uh, driver who came, he thought mother had postpartum depression. The maternal aunt said when, when interviewed by the social worker that mother had bipolar disorder and was taking prescribed medication. Mother herself, she reported that she had depression and bipolar disorder. And the father said mother had bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So already we have so many different um, ideas out there that we're not sure what was mother's mental health, health disability. What was she going to need? But what was the impact of this disability? So she was removed and she was placed on this 5150 hold. When she was released from hospital, she had a higher dosage for psychiatric medication. But there were obviously still concerns that um, were affecting mother. So she wasn't present at the detention because she was in on her 5150 hold. Then at detention hearing, uh, the visitation was found to be detrimental to mother because of her uh, the because of the depth of, of mother's problems. And then she was not present at the jurisdictional hearing because she was admitted to a hospital. So in these crucial first moments of the dependency proceeding, mother was nowhere to be found uh, because of her disability that it had gotten in the way. There was a lot that was known about mother's disability, but it didn't seem that the social worker was really um, going deep into and embracing what mother may have may have needed. For example, in the record, you could see that mother had been hospitalized previously for her psychiatric, treat, psychiatric treatment, but there wasn't a lot of information about that. It, it wasn't something that was easily provided in the report as to what she had had before. Um, we knew she was taking prescribed medications. It wasn't clear what kind of medication, what it was specifically for, uh, how much medication, anything like that. Mother was receiving SSI, but there wasn't any additional information as to why she was receiving SSI. We had various diagnoses that were offered up. Oh, so um, Louise, I just wanted to add, um, particularly important with SSI, it provides benefits for people with dis disabilities and older um, people. And since the mother was uh, not old enough to be receiving SSI due to her age, um, the fact that she was receiving SSI is indication that she had a serious enough disability to receive social security um, SSI benefits. Thanks. Um, and so that was all this information that we were getting this kind of um, about her disability, but we also knew she'd been employed. Uh, so mother was capable of working. She had received psychiatric services in her county. So she was compliant. She was able to, um, to work with the social worker as well. She had good communication. There was never a sense that mother wasn't participating or trying to stay in communication with the agency. So one of the problems with this case too is that mother was living in um, Fresno County. However, the event occurred in Alameda County. So mother and the child lived in uh, Fresno. The event occurred in Alameda. The initial uh, the petition was filed in Fresno County, and then it ultimately was transferred at disposition for disposition in Alameda County. So that was another one of the problems that we had. There was a quite a delay of um, trying to trying to get mother some services, trying to get things started. And again, like I said at that detention hearing, mother mother wasn't given any visitation at all. And then because of the transfer. There were months that went by where that initial decision by the juvenile court judge at detention affected mother's ability to have services, to be able to have visitation. So when it got to disposition, which was done by Alameda County, it was throughout the disposition report is that mother had mental health issues that needed to be addressed and stabilized, that if her needs went unmet, it affected her ability to parent, that she demonstrated behaviors of physical violence and harm that are concerning for the child's safety. And the agency was worried that mother's mental health needs may go unmet if she is not receiving services. So it was clear at DISPO, it was clear from detention that mental health was going to be the focus. The focus. There were no uh, allegations of substance abuse. This family had not had any interaction with, um, with child welfare or with the police or anything prior to this event. So the case plan that was prepared 
for mother, the initial one um, at for dispo was, was really general. Um, mother was supposed to comply with medical or psychological treatment, but there was nothing set forth underneath there under client responsibilities. She was supposed to receive general counseling. Uh, and these were supposed to be therapeutic services to support her mental health needs. But that was, I mean, that was it. That's what we had. And then parenting, uh, to attend parenting classes and then demonstrate your knowledge of what you've learned during those visits with the child. So very, very general, a very general case plan for this mother who clearly had mental health issues. And the agency's responsibilities were also felt uh, somewhat general, provide referrals, have monthly contact, and support their progress. But we don't know what it meant by support their progress or also what it meant by getting services to support her mental health needs. When it came to visitation, again, this was uh, at the beginning. So the detention report recommended reasonable supervised visits, but then at the detention hearing, they, they found visitation to be detrimental because of mother's mental health issues. And then that didn't change. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Aisha, but I think it was like seven months from um, the detention in July and then DISPO, I think, was in October or November. Many, many months where there wasn't any change in visitation. And then once we get, and so mother did not see the child that entire time because visitation had been determined to be detrimental. And when the court made that statement about visitation at detention, mother was not present and the court had relieved mother's counsel. For some reason, which I don't understand how it's done in Fresno, but mother, counsel was there, said, my client's not here. Can I be relieved? And the court said, sure. And then made some findings regarding visitation. So this event that went into place um, was made such an, had such an impact on mother. Uh, and it was because she wasn't really getting the representation that she needed. So there are several problems with the case plan that was first created. First, it did not specify what mother's mental health needs actually were. There was only a general counseling requirement. It was also not specific to address mother's needs. There was no plan for determining what services she might need to address her mental health needs. And there was no plan for knowing how she would succeed. So the case plan was updated once uh, throughout that 18 month period. And uh, again, pretty vague. Um, we, she was supposed to engage in mental health services that would support her stability, which I still don't really know what that meant. Um, she was supposed to have an evaluation and, and that was to work on finding the right medication. Take medication on a regular basis, not substitute marijuana for medication, um, participate in counseling, and again, explore the importance of her stability in keeping her child safe. To me, it was very unclear and never really um, addressed what that meant, what stability would look like for this client. And these were the client's, the mother's responsibilities. And she was very compliant. Uh, she went to counseling. She was compliant with her medication. She met with her nurse practitioner regarding her med med medication. And she participated in individual counseling for the entire um, period of the, of the proceedings. So the problems with the case plan that we saw, it was just too broad. And if you look at that, again, at 16501.1, it did not identify specific goals or appropriately like determine the plan services to meet those goals. And there's that recent case of NRA MR, which again, it's also in your materials, that the case plans must avoid identifying a category of services so broad, it is not possible to explain how they are appropriate. And the fact also that case plans can and should be updated. Uh, it should be an ongoing service as we determine what mother's needs were and that didn't happen in this case. There was up, it was updated the once and then it stayed the same for the remainder of the case. Um, and again, uh, when they first got all this information about mother, it really wasn't clear what mother's needs were. And so, they couldn't get specific because there wasn't really clarity on what 
mother actually needed. And in addition, um, they ended up settling on a diagnosis, but it's not clear that it was correct. Um, and so um, evaluation is really important. Could you go back actually? Yeah, sure. Okay. So proper evaluation of parents with disabilities can be a complex process, potentially involving extensive specialized knowledge and skills. What ended up happening here is it looks like they, um, they looked at the fact that mother was on a 5150 and it had an incident that they had just decided that that incident, um, what uh, is the problem and that she just needed to be in mental health services and then everything would be fixed. There wasn't really a clear look at what was going on. And because of that, we didn't get specialized um, recommendations targeting what would actually be needed. Um, and Patricia W. Case discusses the problem of vague and inconsistent diagnoses that we also see in our case study. So the Patricia W. Court said that the agency, that it failed to see how the agency could discharge its obligation to try to unify the mother with the son and provide the unification services appropriately tailored um, to her needs without a clear diagnosis of her mental illness secured through an evaluation as part of a case plan. There wasn't a careful evaluation of her mental illness or even an effort to secure the kind of psychological evaluation as part of their case plan. And the input of professionals may be necessary, just as an expert opinion is required to determine whether um, a child can safely remain in the custody of a parent with schizophrenia. The input of professionals should be necessary for an agency to appropriately tailor their reunification services. The agency um, in Patricia W. failed to show that it consulted with and provided the mother with access to mental health professionals who could diagnose and prescribe appropriate medication to manage her hallucinations in order to allow her to safely parent. And the agency did not demonstrate that it consulted medical experts about the degree to which the mother could pose a risk to her child, if any, um, if she remained medication compliant. Schizophrenia is a category that encompasses a wide group of disorders and it defies generalization or even professional consensus as to its causes, diagnosis, and treatments. Um, every case is unique. And um, because it's so uh, variable, labeling some patients as having schizophrenia can be equivalent to saying an accident victim with a concussion, fractured spine, broken rims, and a collapsed lung is severely ill. Um, and yeah, and I just, just started to jump in there for a second. I, I think that that quote is so um, key to understanding this is that we have these labels, right? And so we say someone has schizophrenia, well, what does that mean? And if we used it the same way and we said someone is severely ill, we'd want to ask more as to what do you mean that they are severely severely ill? What, what, are, their, what are their injuries? What is it that there is a problem? So I think it's that's what's so important about this Jamie M case, which is an old case um, when, we're, when we're dealing with people with uh, mental health disabilities. Sorry, go ahead, Aisha. Oh, yeah, that's fine. And so because it's so diverse, um, we really do have to go beyond the labels and figure out what exactly a parent um, is, uh, what their disability is and what their needs are and how uh, that could be accommodated in the reunification process. Okay. Uh, and so in, in addition, um, that's why it's so important to understand that diagnosis is not enough. Um, the mere fact that someone is labeled as having schizophrenia really tells you very little about their behavior and its effect on their children. Um, and so it's then difficult for a court to use a crucial and yet nebulous diagnosis in ruling on the proper disposition. And the problem with drawing inferences from the diagnosis of schizophrenia is that it's not well-defined or well-understood. Okay, and you know, for that reason, uh, a diagnosis should not be the conclusion. A diagnosis of schizophrenia should be the court's starting point, not its conclusion. So rather than saying, uh, because the mother has schizophrenia, therefore the, the child is unsafe, 
uh, getting a proper diagnosis should lead to um, an in-depth examination of her psychiatric history, uh, what her present condition is, uh, how she's previously responded to drug therapy, or the potential for future therapy with a focus on what effect that behavior has had and will have on her children. And, and you know, some of what's said here is pretty much what uh, Judge Edwards was setting forth as his ideal approach um, from a ju- for a juvenile court uh, when you have a, fam- a parent with a mental health disability. And part of the, the frustration for me in this case as well is that the social worker didn't really seem to have a lot of understanding or training about mother's mental illness. Um, she, she testified at the 18 month review hearing that she understood mother's diagnosis to be schizophrenia. And that was based on her conversations with mother and her therapist. Um, and the social worker said that stayed based on her conversations with the mother, the symptoms of schizophrenia were active for mother the evening of the minor's removal. So other than that event, the minor's removal, the non-auditory hallucinations, paranoia, and disorganized thinking, there was never anything I saw in the record of mother showing these symptoms again. But even though it was that one event, we were 18 months into the case, and there wasn't really a sense of how could mother show that the child would be safe and how, and, and to me, the fact that she was going to counseling, medication compliant, communicating with the social worker, but those things didn't end up being enough for this parent. And then surprisingly to me at the contested 18 months review hearing, the first, the social worker first just testified that mother did not have special needs. So she was asked that question by mother's counsel and she said no, and then said, oh no, no, she has schizophrenia and then clarified well, I quickly considered mental health issues as a special need, but I think she has serious needs. So it was kind of this hodgepodge of mother needs something, but the, the, the agency wasn't providing necessarily what mother needed, and they weren't really clear on what mother needed. Um, the social worker also testified that she did not have any training in what types of parenting interventions were helpful for parents with schizophrenia. So she consulted with mother's clinician, clinician and then her social worker supervisor, who the supervisor had experience in working with parents with schizophrenia, and that was how she figured out how to help the mother parent the child. And what she was told was to be clear with mother and not to assume anything. That to me, if you're saying that a parent has um, schizophrenia and that they are unsafe and that they've put their child in harm's way, and all we're going to say now in helping them is you need to be clear and not to assume anything. That to me doesn't seem like reasonable services. Even though the social worker agreed that a parent with significant mental health, di- mental health diagnoses would sometimes need help thinking how to make it to appointments consistently. So it was again that broad brush of just saying that the mother has this diagnosis of schizophrenia, but then not actually digging deep into what she needed. For example, mother was in Fresno and the visitation was in um, Pleasanton or Oakland. And again, you know, mother had two visits, uh, her therapeutic in-person visits before the pandemic shut everything down. So we had that other layer that was going on here. So we had a mother and a child who lived in um, in um, Fresno, but they were getting services from Alameda. So everything shut down. And then when the Alameda social worker asked Fresno to help assist with visitation, Fresno said, oh, we have to help our clients first, right? Things have been crazy because of the um, pandemic. Things have been shut down. So when it opens up again, we're going to help our clients first. So mother, even though she lived closest to Fresno and to the services there, was getting them in Alameda. So she had to take a train to these um, to these uh, visits because there could only be therapeutic visits. So mom asked for there to be a later start time um, because sometimes she was tardy. And that I think the train ride is a couple of hours. I think it's like 175 miles one way. It's a couple hours. And and her I think her start time was around 11. Sorry. I think it was round trip. Okay. 
So she and I had spoken to mother and, you know, she said that she'd have to leave and go to the train station at like six o'clock in the morning to try and get there on time with the with the transfers and all of that. So when mother requested an accommodation for a later start time, the agency said no. But what they did offer was, well, you should buy an extra alarm clock or you should place your alarm clock further from the bed or you should lay out your clothes the night before or you should have a friend help you wake up. That to me doesn't seem like reasonable services, just tell, telling someone that they should buy an extra alarm clock. And mother knew enough to actually, you know, she was asking, I, I need help. And part of the to add here, um, the second concern is that mother has medication that made her sleepy. And she expressed this. Um, it, it's common for psychiatric uh, medication to have side effects, including sleepiness. Uh, and if you can imagine for this mother um, traveling, having to get to the station at 6 a.m., which would be difficult for, for most people. But if you add that, the fact that the mother is taking probably serious medication that has side effects that make it hard to wake, um, you could see how this compounds to make it very difficult for anyone to be able to comply with. Exactly. And when mother raised her concern about the medication, there was, there was no response from the agency. And mother was not able to reunify in this case, even though she completed parenting class, she stayed in communication with her social worker, she was medication compliant, she attended counseling, she visited with her child as she was able to, um, again, because of the pandemic, because of the distance, it was difficult. And again, this, the child was, I think he was around two when he was removed. And then there was a seven month period when he didn't have any any interaction with mother because of that original detrimental finding at, at, um, at detention. And so mother did visit, uh, but it was not as seamless as it would have liked to have been because of the problems that existed at the beginning. And mother was willing to engage in a safety plan. Sorry, I thought I had corrected that typo. Um, but she did not believe that she could have harmed her child. And that ended up being a big sticking point for the agency is that mother hasn't learned in their, in their belief that she had not learned because she couldn't remember harming the child. So at the 18 month review hearing, the juvenile court noted and said they recognized that mental health concerns have always been kind of a part of the narrative of this case. But then the court stated that the agency was aware of these mental health concerns and that they were not ignored and that mother was given the opportunity to engage in visitation and was supported in doing so. Um, before we get to, yeah, before we get to that, uh, the, 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 the court of appeal did not agree with us when we tried to raise this reasonable services um, issue and they really kind of skirted the mental health issue, which was concerning to us as well. But the agency, the, the court found that the agency had provided reasonable services to mother. And just wanted to add, um, the court mentioned that the mental health um, needs were not ignored. Uh, that's an incredibly low bar um, to set for reasonable tailoring. And, um, you know, we think that definitely it, this bears pushing. Um, on when, whenever possible, because there should be more than just not ignoring. Um, it's, it's not enough to just say, I see you have a mental health disability. There should be actual appropriate tailoring. Where improvements could have been made. Uh, mother's disability was not properly assessed from the outset. There were um, sources of information that weren't followed up on, including the reason for mother um, receiving SSI. Um, the effect of medication was not considered or taken into account when raised by the mother. Um, the social worker did not have training regarding the mother's specific needs. The advice given was simply inadequate. Um, the case plan itself wasn't tailored to the mother's specific needs, in large part because her needs were unknown. It's still unclear. Um, like we generally talked about some of the things that the agency had problems with. There were other difficulties that mother was having with respect to um, demonstrating the parenting knowledge that they were expecting. And the, the case notes basically say, uh, mother doesn't seem to understand this. Mother isn't aware of you know, 
this X, Y, Z. Uh, and it's not clear if there is potentially another disability in play that was preventing mother from, even though she attended the parenting class, graduated and got their certificate, fully internalizing the information. But again, there wasn't a look into why mother wasn't able to understand um, certain aspects of parenting. Well, and then, and I think also too, um, because there had been such a delay in the visitation getting started, that mother herself said, he doesn't know me that way. Her child didn't know him, her that way. And that, so she didn't want to all of a sudden have these visits and then be discipline him, disciplining him or, you know, quote, parenting him. She wanted to have that opportunity to get to, um, to get to know him without that other kind of negative parenting aspect, which the agency was kind of looking to, right? Looking to see how she could parent. And so I think that was a difficult, that added another layer of difficulty as well to mother being able to, um, to reunify. Yeah, and you know, in addition, we talk about not properly assessing disability, um, particularly with um, you know, people of color, um, there are a lot of children who don't have learning disabilities that are assessed, um, particularly black children are less likely to be successfully um, uh, identified as having a learning disability. There might be auditory processing disability that make disabilities that make parent have a hard time internalizing information. Um, and when you see a client, when you see the statements like, uh, you know, client isn't understanding, client isn't, um, able to um, follow through properly, you might wanna be looking to see if there might be other dis disabilities in play. Um, the case plan, like I said, there, it wasn't tailored to the mother's specific needs. There weren't reasonable accommodations made. Uh, telling the mother to buy a second alarm clock isn't, isn't reasonable. Flag that visitation was affected by the pandemic and the distance between the counties, but there was also not accommodations made for that. So an adequate case plan and reunification services is going to be the key to success. And part of the hurdle that we were not able to overcome on the appeal is that mother, so because of the pandemic and because of the delays that were caused, especially with visitation, at the six month and the 12 month review hearing, mothers, the, the agency recommended six more months of services. And so there wasn't an objection to a finding of reasonable services. An objection was made by the trial, by the trial attorney just generally to visitation, but there was nothing, no objection to um, the case plan as it had been prepared and all of that. So when it got to the 18 month review hearing and then when it got to us trying to raise that issue and the writ petition, you know, the response from the court of appeal at oral argument was, what what relief could have been given to mother, right? She got at that six month review hearing, she got another six months. At that 12 month review hearing, she got another six months. But what that fails to take into account is getting the same services that don't work for you is not going to help you get any better. So that's um, that was one of the things that was, was so very difficult uh, for us to address was just because she did get more services, but those additional services weren't they weren't changed, they weren't updated. So that's when we get to this part. Okay, so what can um, advocate, so this is a list of things that all advocates, trial and appellate can do um, to better support parents with disabilities. First, be on the lookout for clients with disabilities, not all self-disclose, you might have to develop a relationship with them to, for, to get them to trust you enough to disclose. They might not even think of themselves as a person with disabilities. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that they're not legally protected and that you can't uh, use disability frameworks as arguments on their behalf. Um, you wanna identify the specific needs for accommodations. What does the parent need to succeed? It might be they need to take a parenting class in a building that is physically accessible. They might need a cell interpreter. They might need um, written, uh, they might need written instructions in addition to audio instructions. Um, to help them understand and process information. They might need to attend a specialty class or specialty services. So identify you know, what actually needs to happen for the client and then 
what are some of the things that need to be accommodated. Um, one of the ways to figure that out is to review previous accommodations used by your clients in the past. Uh, so um, one source um, that might be available is if the child was receiving special education services during their K through 12 education or in college, you can look to that as a source of information of what might be needed for the um, parent in their services. Um, you also wanna make sure to thoroughly review the case plan. Does it properly identify your client's needs and have a specific enough plan to assist your client? Um, challenge inadequacies early on, as soon as possible. The goal is for the parent to get appropriate services ASAP. Um, and so that as the limited time goes by, they're not spending too much time on uh, the wrong kinds of services. Um, you also wanna make sure to offer your legal, legal services in an accessible manner and make accommodations as needed for clients. Consult reference materials like the ones we provided and others as needed. Um, reach out for guidance um, and make sure to address disability in a respectful manner when interacting with your clients, reports, and social, um, social workers. So this was specifically, what can appellate practitioners do? And this is one of those situations where um, I, I wish we had an answer, right? We don't have an answer. And part of the problem is the fact that the ADA the, the California courts have determined that ADA does not apply in dependency proceedings. I mean, it, it's 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 outrageous to me on, on so many levels. So I wish I could have a solid, good answer, um, but this is going to be something that we can get incremental change. It's not going to change overnight. And I think part of what we have to do for all of us is work together, right? So as appellate practitioners, talk to and work with trial counsel. You know, they're the ones who have the majority of the interaction with the they're the client. They're going to know maybe what worked and what didn't work. You know, is this someone who works better by email? Do they work better by phone? You know, are there ways that you can communicate that that will draw them in, right? And review the record and look for areas where the parent's disability was was not accommodated. So, and that goes to partly, you know, with the trial attorneys, that if we can get in at dispo, right? If there can be an appeal from dispo. We can, the appellate attorneys can then work with the trial attorney throughout. If we're getting a case at, at, at the 2 6 hearing after parental rights have been terminated, we can't go back to these issues. You know, we're kind of stuck. So the hope is that we can have a sense as, um, as appellate and trial practitioners to work together. Because if we don't, we're going to keep facing forfeiture and or waiver, right? If things aren't brought up at the trial court level, we can't bring it up on appeal. And the county's gonna be the first ones to tell us that. And the court of appeal is gonna be the first ones to say, gosh, wish we could address this, but we can't um, and we won't. So what our goal is here uh, is to educate the court, right? The juvenile courts and the court of appeal. Educa educate ourselves. Uh, I learned so much working with Aisha just on what to look for. Uh, the whole bit about SSI, you know, not necessarily realizing that distinction between you're going to be getting it if you have a, a serious mental health issue or if you have a disability or if you're older. So knowing kind of what to look for, knowing then as the appellate practitioner to talk to trial counsel and say, hey, do you know what's going on with this? Or maybe we need to work a little bit more about that. Again, as well, be aware of your own bias. Uh, sometimes these clients can be challenging and uh, we need to be aware of that in the way that we approach uh, our clients and to be creative. So I wish there was some case law that said exactly what we needed to say, uh, that never happens, but there is some good case law, law out there. There is Patricia W, there is Jamie M, there is Elizabeth R. I mean, there's cases out there that can help you to be creative in your argument. Okay, um, so uh, to follow up um, on what we talked about, about delivering um, services in an accessible manner, one of the things that we wanna um, provide guidance on is disability language. Um, a lot of uh, court decisions, um, documents can use really alienating language. And so we'd like to help you have these uh, tools to help your advocacy, to help you connect with your clients better and to hopefully help 
the fields um, towards using better language um, around disability. So because language is constantly evolving, uh, these can always be sub subject to change, but here are some general guidelines. You wanna avoid outdated words like handicap or handicapped, those really only belong on the golf course not for disability advocacy, uh, and also the R word you want to avoid. Uh, instead, you can use disability or disabled or um, for the R word, intellectual disability. Uh, you want to avoid defining someone by their disability. So no wheelchair bound, confined to a wheelchair or wheelchair person. You don't wanna call someone a paraplegic or a schizophrenic. Um, Instead, you can use the words that uses a wheelchair, has paraplegia, has schizophrenia, um, or is a person with schizophrenia. Now, exceptions to that are you can refer to someone as blind or deaf. You also want to avoid the language of suffering. So you don't wanna say that someone suffers from bipolar disorder, is afflicted with multiple sclerosis or struggles with depression. Instead, you can say someone has major depression, someone has cancer. Uh, you want to avoid euphemisms and imprecise terminology. So special needs, differently abled, mental health issues. Instead, you wanna state the specific disability. Avoid references to mental age. So saying someone has the mind or the mental ability of a six-year-old, it's not actually scientifically uh, sound. Instead, you wanna state um, and also it's not that helpful because it's not specific. So instead of state, you wanna state the specific disability, the functional difficulty or the need for accommodation. So you might say Lisa has a learning disability or limited reading proficiency, or she needs written instructions in plain language with bullet points accompanied with oral explanations. So then instead of simply saying, you know, she has the mind of a six-year-old, you've given the social worker, you've given the court specific guidance on what's needed. And I think that's the, the key here, right? Is that if you if you if you have these broad brush strokes, you're not actually getting to what that parent needs, what that person needs uh, to be able to safely parent their child. Right. And I just want to add quickly, um, I was asked if I could comment on the challenge of persuading a client to accept. Um, it's very difficult. You know, in this case, mother didn't have memory of the incident. And it was hard, like it would be for a lot of people who don't remember this happening, to believe that she could hurt her child. I think most people would think that they couldn't. Um, but there's case law in the material that talk about this idea of like lack of insight um, or paranoia that could be a part of a disability. Um, and what that one case in particular mentioned is that it was enough to be willing to engage, even if they didn't subjectively believe they could harm their child. So you might wanna say, listen, I get it. You know, you don't believe it, um, but you could just say that while well, the parent doesn't think they would um, harm their child, they're willing to create the safety plan. They're willing to do the steps. And I think, um, so Richard also asked a question about how to key these, these cases up. And we have another question too, which I think they're related in the sense, because Mara asked, shouldn't we continue to raise the ADA over and over again? And that's where that working together is, um, is so important because if, if something isn't raised in the trial court, we are going to face forfeiture and waiver in the appellate court. And so that's that hope is that if we can get some help for these uh, parents at the beginning of the case, you know, at dispo uh, phase, filing a notice of appeal at that point, that's going to serve that client so much better. Get, get the agency, get the social workers, get them open or aware and be prepared that we're expecting more for our clients, right? It's not gonna just be that, okay, you're going to say that you need to do something to support her stability. What does that mean? And I think if we expect more, hopefully we will get more. Um, so that's why, yes, we can continue to raise these, these the ADA issues. I mean, I do think that is something that, that it, it seems so outdated. And Aisha, like you were saying, how things change, that those cases that said the ADA doesn't apply are from many years ago. And there are, if, I, if I'm correct, there are other jurisdictions that do say that the ADA applies in juvenile dependency proceedings. And so, yes, we, we do need to, um, 
we do need to work together. We do need to keep raising these things, but we also need to make sure we're teeing them up so that they don't get just thrown out by the court. I hope this has been informative and has given you kind of new ways and maybe a new energy on how to assist our clients. Again, look to our materials. They have a lot more information than what we went through today. And feel free to reach out with any questions you might have. And this concludes our presentation. Thank you, everyone.